All right, so I shot a half hour pilot. Here's what I learned. I shot a pilot, look at me. So to be clear, uh, I didn't get my big break. A studio didn't give me a hundred million dollars to shoot a pilot and become, you know, Phoebe Waller-Bridge or anything like that. I was in grad school. This was my thesis project for film school. Um, yeah, and it was it was super indie. It was basically zero budget. It was out of pocket. It was me. That's what we're dealing with. Yeah, so I was in grad school. I started in 2015. I was 27 or 26 at the time, so I was a little bit older. Uh, I'd worked in uh, reality TV production before that. I worked in a production office, so I wasn't completely new to this. But yes, this was going to be me, my thesis. I was going to be the producer. Um, I had a producing partner who was going to direct it for me, and we were just going to indie film, rock it out, a whole half hour pilot. Yeah, so I pretty much decided by the time I started grad school that my thesis project was going to be some kind of half hour pilot. Um, traditionally, I figured out later that the thesis projects were usually short films, five to ten minutes long. That was kind of the thing. And uh, I kept asking because I wanted to make sure I could, I could do it can I shoot my half hour pilot? I kept getting yeses, I kept getting noes, I was getting conflicting answers from conflicting department heads, that whole thing, so I just decided I was gonna keep doing it. Ultimately, what would happen was, after several department heads came to me and said, hey, why don't you shoot half of the pilot? I was like, well, that kinda seems crazy because then I will have shot half a pilot but don't have a whole pilot, so what's the, like, I don't understand the point of that. So ultimately, uh, I committed myself to shooting a half hour pilot even though knowing I was probably only gonna show the first half or the first act of the of the show. So I had a small crew, I had a crew of five. The, that was by design, I wanted to be small, I wanted to be limber. We we're gonna have like three actors come in, we were just gonna be just running around, shooting stuff, dialogue, comedy, having a good time. That was the whole, you know, that was the plan. No big, no big set, no big production, we we're just gonna knock it out and get out of there and get on with our lives. Comedy. So the budget? Two to three thousand uh, dollars, and it was out of pocket. A lot of my classmates did some version of crowdfunding. Some of them were also independently wealthy because we were in a fancy private school. It was a thing. Um, I basically decided if I was ever going to do crowdfunding, this was not going to be the production for that because I just couldn't get my head around the idea that I would be asking people to finance my career. Basically, that just seemed kind of yucky. So I decided I was just going to do it all on myself. So I basically just the whole time I was in school. I, I went to school, I produced this later on, and I drove Grubhub, and it was an absolute nightmare, and I did that. The, the other thing I should mention about sort of any films, because that's kind of the, the thing I was doing, was um, usually as soon as the money shows up, you go. So the script might not be in perfect condition, but the idea is you, as if you get financing, you start spending the money immediately because you don't know if it's going to disappear, so you just got to use it when you use it even if the script sucks. I had a lot of time and my script went through like a year of workshopping, so I thought the script was in pretty good shape, especially the, the dialogue and the jokes, but y you never know. We had three actors and that was by design. We had one main and then two friends and it was gonna be a whole like, you know, it was gonna be like an Always Sunny kind of vibe where they just hang out and they do they do stuff and that's the, that's the show. I also stupidly wrote a lot of extras into my show. And so pretty much every single scene had a bunch of extras. So we had many times more extras on set than we did anybody else. And that was, um, that was messy. Yeah, so we had the director, the DP, a sound person, and then we had PAs. But they were basically just swing because we didn't have really a lighting and grip department. And so my producing partner, who's a director, DP, was going to direct. We, uh, I was going to run sound and just sort of babysit the script, script supervise, that whole thing. And then our buddies were just going to do everything else. And then we were going to uh, hire out a DP. But we decided pretty quickly that we wanted somebody who we worked with before because we don't want somebody coming in and sort of hijacking the production. And they need to be sort of flexible for what we're doing because we're just kind of just running in chaos. The, the vision I had was sort of the league or Curb Your Enthusiasm or The Office where we just had a couple of people with cameras just recording takes, didn't really light it, and we just... We just you know, cruised. We ended up finding this guy. He had worked with my producing partner who was going to direct and they worked together. So she said he was cool. So we, we gave him the script. We did this whole thing. He was going to shoot it for us. No problemo. So originally we were thinking we didn't want to have to carry any lights around. So we wanted outdoor locations and just use God's light for everything. The big thing about locations is we wanted them to be free because I was doing this out of pocket. We didn't have any money. The campus we were on was a film school and was a regular college. So they were film friendly. So basically any building on campus and any location on campus, you could book through the permitting process. To the school's credit, the permitting process is basically the same as the LA permitting process, which is to say a pain in the ass, but you know, at least they got the muscles in. So here's the, here's the thing about locations. 
Uh, my script was, it was a bar. So there's a bar on campus. So we went to there and we figured out that because it has alcohol, you need a security person there the whole time that you need to pay and you need to pay to rent the location. And I didn't have any money, so that was out. So the plan B was gonna, we were gonna find a coffee shop on campus or just a place we could dress as like a coffee shop or a bar on campus. And that, and that was gonna be that. What actually ended up happening is I would go through the process and go through this, you know, the resources and talk to whoever I needed to talk to, get sign off, get signatures, to get the permit for, I think, a coffee shop. And then that fell through for reasons that had nothing to do with me. And then we had the movie theater. There's a movie theater on campus. We're gonna do them working at a movie theater. And then the movie theater fell through. And then uh, the, the, the great one that I really liked was the laundromat. So the main character's parents owned a laundromat. That's why everybody would hang out at the laundromat. There's a laundry on campus. And I was going to shoot it overnight when nobody was there at the laundromat. It was going to be awesome. It was going to be inside. We were just going to knock it out. No big deal. Uh, well, it turns out the film school got in a beef with the housing and dining department. And the housing and dining department basically said, nope, you can no longer shoot on any of our stuff. And so I just had my, my permit terminated. I don't even honestly blame whoever whoever caused that to happen. Film schools, especially students, they're messy and they make mistakes and they and they rub people the wrong way. Films do, and so it makes sense that different departments are like, I don't want to work with film stuff anymore. I get it. It was annoying though. Ultimately, parking lots. For some reason, I could book any parking lot I wanted at any time I wanted. So I just booked a bunch of parking lots and I sort of rejiggered the script so that the main character was sort of a Postmates person where she was professionally standing in line for people. People would pay her on the app to stand in line for a concert or for a video game release, which in context makes less sense now that I talk about it. But all these different reasons why she would stand in line, she was doing that and they would just find her online, like basically tailgating. It was kind of funny, but as I'm explaining it, you understand how that's too complicated of a conceit for for like what I what we were trying to do. It was just, it was too complicated and the layers of explaining made it worse. Ironically, in the time of COVID, that whole standing in line thing makes a lot of sense. I think there's actually a show out now where the person professionally stands in line. So uh, was, I, was I ahead of my time or was I just desperate and coming up with crazy ideas? Hard to say, uh, none of it benefited me. So yeah, the, the, the parking lot thing was, was our first big issue um, when we were actually in production. So I'm, I'm gonna fast forward a little bit so I can talk about the parking lot situation because that was sort of the biggest situation we kept coming across, which was that I had forgotten that this was Los Angeles. So the, even though it's a parking lot, um, there's more cars in Los Angeles than there are parking spaces, it seems like. So no matter, even this was a private school, even this was days where, you know, you had to have a permit to park there, there was always that one car that would drive the whole length of the parking lot and not find a spot windows down, music blaring, the whole thing, and then turn around and drive the whole length of the parking lot waiting for a spot. And then we just find a spot that's convenient, which unfortunately for us was always by our production. And they would just idle and wait for somebody to leave. It's a thing in LA. I haven't really seen this happen anywhere else in the country, but yeah, it was, I wasn't surprised by it, but I was like, oh my God, we're going to be dealing with cars idling the whole time. And it didn't happen at every parking lot, but there was specifically one day where we were at a much smaller parking lot that we had control over and we had like half the spaces occupied by our production and it was a Saturday. And what I didn't think about was on Saturdays, the school opens parking for everybody. And so just random people come in to have like picnics and they park in this parking lot. And so all day people were coming in and doing the whole like, you know, hanging out thing, which was bad. And we ended up putting a, putting one of our guys at the end, basically just directing traffic saying, Hey, the parking lot's full, which some people took as sure. I'll go find another one. And other people said, eat shit, I'm gonna go find a parking spot here. And then they would, you know, just idle for the next 20 minutes. The, what I figured out though, is that parking lot that we were in where we were shooting next to, next to us was this big private gate to a private residence that was part of campus, but it was its own private thing um, because of private school reasons. And so that person would drive full speed through the parking lot, music blaring, whatever. And a couple times I stopped him so we could get the production going because we we're trying to take sound. And uh, at one point he just wouldn't take no for an answer. And I stood in front of the car and I thought he was gonna get out and throw, do, throw down with me. Fast forward to a couple weeks later when I was uh, you know, basically turning in my equipment, the guy who signed my permits like straight up asked me, he's like, yeah, we had a complaint. Somebody was stopping traffic. You know, you're not supposed to do that. Yeah, yeah, we were, we were doing that. He goes, he goes, yeah, this person at this, at this location and he named the location was stopping traffic and that's a problem. But he said the wrong name of the location, so I did sort of a lie by omission. I said, no, I wasn't there, which was true because he said the wrong name, but he was definitely talking about our production. If he had said it was this location and he named it correctly, I would have said, yeah, that was us. And I'm pretty sure he would have shut down the production, and I think I might have been kicked out of school. Like, it was a really bad situation, and so don't ever do that. That's 
That's hor the whole thing was horrible, but then nothing came of it because of a tiny, a tiny lie. And that is such a, such a shitty message, but it seems to be sort of the way filmmaking goes sometimes, unfortunately. I'm doing my best to never allow that kind of behavior to happen again. Uh, let's talk about cameras. So, so I was talking about how it's going to be, you know, improvised and loose and people are moving around. So we're going to do two cameras. But it's not a multicam, it's just, you know, we're, do, we're shooting the office style or Kirby Enthusiasm style. So we're going to do cross coverage. So if you don't know what cross coverage is, basically it's you shoot the wide and then when you set up for the closer stuff, um, you do cross coverage so that if there's two people talking, one camera is doing a mid one way, and one camera is doing a mid on the other person, and you grab the mids. And then if you need the tights, you do it again and you grab the tights. So your, your cameras are literally crossing each other. A lot of films don't like to do cross coverage because the lighting isn't perfect, but again, we had already had agreed that lighting was going to be just a non, a non thing for us. Uh, we we're also going to do long takes and, and uh, resets. And what that means is uh, instead of calling cut after a take, and then having everybody reset, especially the actors, we would just call reset and the actors would go back to one and, and start again. I've learned now that that is a terrible, terrible, terrible way to treat your actors because it completely discombobulates them and messes them up. Some of them are cool and can hang. We had one guy who was, it didn't bother him, but, or it didn't outwardly bother him. But yeah, it, it just messes with the actors and it messes with the crew. And also the boom person is doing this for, yeah, some of those takes were 20 or 30 minutes. Like it was, it was not great. Yeah. We learned our lesson after day one to not run the camera so long after that. Also, it was terrible for the edit. Syncing all this audio and these two cameras for a 20 minute thing, sure, that was, that was not easy, but it was not impossible. But then actually editing it was extremely difficult. So the workflow. Uh, so the thing about the two cameras is I, I had thought about going to the camera, camera shop on campus that they would have rented it out for free. Uh, because I was, uh, you know, a grad student in my in my final year uh, doing my thesis, I pretty much got any camera I wanted, but I only got one and I knew I wanted two. In hindsight, I should have just said, give me two of the cameras you can promise me and they would have given me two camcorders. We would have been perfect. We would have been in a great situation that would have actually helped everything. But instead, I realized, well, I want, if I want the fancy camera, I'm not going to be able to get the other fancy camera because they're only going to promise me one. And all the cameras go out every weekend, no matter what, because it's just a busy, busy film school. And so instead, my director slash DP has her own camera, and ultimately she had two by that point. So she had the square Blackmagic camera, that was our A-cam, and then she had just picked up a Sony a7 II, not an a7S, but an a7 II, a 1080 camera. So she had two cameras. I had heard mixing different cameras was bad, but I was like, any camera's better than no camera. Knowing what I know now, especially as a, cover, a colorist, I would strongly urge against mixing different cameras at all. Let's talk about audio. Boom plus laughs. And this was actually weird because I had come from television where everybody is mic'd at all times. Everybody has a lav. Sometimes there's a boom operator. I'd seen a lot of live shows and pretty much everybody on a live show has a lav. And so when I went to when I went to rent what was apparently many times more pieces of audio equipment than a regular production from the audio department in school, the boss actually sat me down and gave me sort of a clinic on how to operate stuff and was basically trying to convince me, hey, all you need is a boom. You need somebody with a boom and maybe they're mixing as they go and you'll get everything you need. Um, well, first of all, we knew we were shooting outside at that point. And second of all, I don't believe in that at all. And he wasn't, he wasn't having it, but ultimately he just, he just let me rent a bunch of laughs plus a boom and kind of made fun of me. And honestly, I don't regret it. Uh, from every production I've been on since then that I've, that I've had the say, everybody wears a lav. Yes, it sucks to do sync and post, but you have the audio. This Ours was the only production that year, I think, that didn't have to do ADR. A lot of the productions just didn't do ADR, but they should have done ADR. We had clean audio mostly every single time, and that's because of the labs, even though the boss just couldn't let it go that that was a total waste of time and that we should just trust our boom operator, who was gonna be uh, me, and then later it was my buddy. We did for the last couple of days actually hire an audio guy, and I paid him because he, I hired him because we needed somebody, and. I couldn't do it and my buddy couldn't do it. So I paid him a PA's day rate for I think one or two days on set and I don't regret it. I only regret that I didn't pay everybody else. Let's talk about problems. Yeah, so parking lot. So obviously the problems were noise all the time. Uh, even when we weren't in parking lots, we were next to the dorms during finals week. And my thinking was because I had been out of school and I was stupid apparently, is finals week means everybody's gonna be quiet and studying and practicing and just you know trying to get out. Uh, because that's how I was, because I was a nerd. But as it turns out, during finals week, if you live in the dorms, you go to your finals, and then you drink and party at the dorms the rest of the time, and so there was music playing, and people partying, and drunk people walking through our shots at all times on this private campus. 
it sucked. We even had uh, one of our extras was like a stunt guy and he properly scared the crap out of these kids in this dorm. And I don't understand why they didn't call the campus police on us, but I appreciate that they didn't. Um, the other thing was obviously the sunlight. Sunlight moves and that was, uh, that was the whole thing. And then just the fact that we were shooting outdoors on campus, we had people having picnics, we had people walking through shots. It was like a whole thing. Like I said before, the cameras were mismatched, which was not great, but they were my director's cameras. So the theory was she and I had a pretty good understanding of how to operate them. We've both operated them. But ultimately when it came down to it, there was sort of a misunderstanding because I thought we were doing cross coverage, which is what I described, but we very quickly were shooting standard coverage just with an extra camera. So we would do the wide, then we do the medium and the tight on one side, and then we do the medium and the tight on the other side. And that's how we were operating. And the first day I didn't really say anything because our DP was working with my director. So it wasn't really my place. And the second day, which I'll get into in a minute about why, but I was DPing. And so we were doing this wide and then one side, wide and the other side. And I, and I at some point talked to my director. I was like, why, why, are we, why are we shooting this way? I thought we were doing cross coverage. She goes, no, no, we're not doing cross coverage. So at some point there was a misunderstanding because I thought we were doing, you know, curb your enthusiasm cross coverage, but instead we are doing sort of fast feature work or fast TV work where it's the same format of wide, medium, tight on one side, wide, medium, tight on the other side. It's just, you have an extra camera. So you do wide, medium, tight, wide, medium, tight, which I'm not convinced sped us up at all. I think the extra complexity of us doing it that way actually probably slowed us down and we were better off shooting one camera, which we would learn. Uh, let me talk about day one because day one is day one. I don't know anybody who sleeps before the first day of a new set. I've, I, you're exhausted. It's, you, you don't get a whole lot done. Uh, don't have anything important scheduled that day because you're not going to get it done. It's just chaos. I think it took us three or four hours to get the camera up. It was a mess. And then we just had, we just had problems happening. And so at the risk of talking shit about somebody, our DP, who I wasn't super familiar with, but he was he was familiar. A bunch of things kept happening. He kept arguing with us, especially my director. And again, even though I come from television and this was a television pilot, the director is still the boss. The DP can't bark at the director. That's not how things go. And especially not, you know, like for morale reasons, nobody should be yelling at anybody, even though I've been on student sets and people yell. I'm not a fan. I think we shot like two takes and then the DP goes, all right, I need a new card. And I was like, what, what are you talking about? I've been using this black magic camera for several years now. And I know that the SSD on there, it, it's like a one terabyte. It takes like a day to fill up in, in ProRes. Like, what, what are we doing here? Adult me is like, why did I only have one SSD? That is absolutely crazy. I had multiple memory cards for the second camera, but I only had the one SSD because of they're expensive. And I was like, what are, you, what are you talking about? He goes, yeah, you know, raw, raw takes up a lot of footage. That's why the card's maxed out. And, and I was like, oh, so here's where I'm a little confused because I don't know if we told him you need to shoot in ProRes, we're going to shoot in 1080 ProRes, or if we just didn't mention it because we had already set the camera up for 1080 ProRes. It's, it's, the camera has been in that 1080 ProRes forever. I don't think she's ever switched it to raw ever just because that's her workflow. And he just, without asking us, switched it over to raw and maxed out the card. And so instead of having like eight hours of footage, we had like six minutes and now we can't use our camera. And I did this stupid thing where I tried to plug the SSD into my computer and dump it onto a little tiny spinny hard drive. And it was going to take like eight or nine hours. And I was like, well, this is not going to work. So we're down to camera. What I should have done is I should have just deleted all of that footage and said, well, we lost, we lost the last hour of takes. We're starting over. There we go. But I didn't think it through. And because I wasn't in charge, I mean, I was the producer, but I was, I was doing sound and I was really just babysitting the audio and the script. For some reason in the chain of command of the director of photography, the director and me, nobody thought to just format the card and start over. Uh, or if it got mentioned, it got said no to quite, a, quite immediately. I don't know. So that was bad. Then that was the moment where we were like, what, come on, man, what are you doing? Like, I think I pulled him aside for five minutes to take five and said, hey, can't be pulling an audible like that. You got to communicate with us. And he was just not having it. And that's not great. Uh, I've worked with people that are not having it. I'm not a fan of working with people not having it. I, I will continue to work with people not having it when I have to, but I don't like to. And then a bunch of other things. He was just kind of like rude and dismissive and just unwilling to, unwilling to take input, even though it seemed like he was not on the same page as us at all. And it got to a point where, you know, we had this 12 by, we didn't have any lighting, but uh, you know, the camera shop rented out a 12 by for us just to block the light or to cut the light or whatever. And we knew how to work with a 12 by, but because the director of photography was sort of the one in charge of the 12 by, I asked him, I was like, hey, are you familiar with how to do this? He goes, yeah, conversation over. And so when you're up on a bluff next to the ocean with a big 12 by frame, it's at least 12 feet off the ground, the wind's gonna catch it. Yes, we had a bunch of sandbags. Yes, we ratcheted it down, but at some point, 
you need somebody there to sort of protect it from, you know, knocking it over. And sure enough, the wind picked up and it almost took the head off one of our extras uh, just out of nowhere. And f fortunately, somebody stopped it. But I, I shut the production down and I said, OK, we need to have we're going to take this down, take this apart. We need to have a conversation. And I, and I was like, dude, I thought you said you were good with the 12 by like I basically said, hey, this is your department, like either have the 12 by and have somebody standing on it or don't have the 12 by. And he basically said, whatever, dude. And I was like, okay, this is a problem. And at that point, secretly, the director came up to me and said, well, hey, we need to get rid of him. She's my producing partner. I take what she says very seriously. And I said, stupidly, let's wait and see. You know, let's have a conversation during lunch. I think we just need to stay with him for a while. So the rest of the day, we basically shot the whole thing on the, on the Sony, uh, just the one camera, traditional style, and things sort of smoothed out a little bit, except for the camera sensor was dirty. And so when I went to look at the footage later, there was dirt all over the camera sensor. Not great. Also at lunch, again, me and the me and the director uh, splintered off to sort of have a production meeting to be like, what what is happening? Like this is this is falling apart in front of us. And she she again said, hey, you need to get rid of this guy. I'm telling you. And I said, let's just let's wait him out the rest of the day. I'll call him at night. I'll get rid of him. But let's just let's stick with what we have. Let's keep our noses to the grindstone and just figure this out. And that was a that was a terrible 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 choice, a mistake that I made. But we did. The rest of the day was just brutal, just not great. You know, we did sort of figure out a rhythm since we had one camera now and we could actually do it, but it wasn't great. Uh, that night after the production, I called him and said, hey, listen, thank you for coming. Uh, it's, I need, we needed somebody to really, you know, work with us, stay in the swing of things with us, like stay, stay on our level. And, and it just like, doesn't seem like you're willing to do that. Nothing personal, I'm not gonna talk bad about you. I just don't think we can work together. So we don't need you tomorrow or the rest of the shoot. And he goes, yeah, I figured it and he hung up on me. And I, again, I'm not going to try to drag his name through the, through the mud because we were asking a lot. We were a very messy, very chaotic first day production. And I think he expected a camera team, a LNG team, a, a whole production. And he didn't get any of it. It was just him holding a camera. I will say early and often, we were very clear that there was only going to be like four or five of us. So I don't understand why he would have expected a big crew, uh, but it seemed like he did. It, it, whatever. The other thing was actor availability and the fact that I shot everything on the weekends because my thinking was, well, these actors, they're not, they're not broken out yet. So they're, you know, they have day jobs. And so most of them work during the week. So on the weekends, we'll all get together. We'll knock it out. We'll have a great time. And then, you know, I'm not interfering with them earning money, especially because I'm not paying them. Yeah. When you don't pay people, um, you can only really promise credit and a copy of the film and, you know, just a script for them to sink their teeth into, which is basically promising nothing. You pay people because they're worth something. These people, you're, you're, when you're not paying them, you're saying, hey, can you do this for me in the interest of me? And whether or not they decide to show up, even after they've said yes, is really up to them. So I'm not actually faulting anybody for not showing up, but yeah, we had uh, two actors that were absolute champs. And if anything, I feel really terrible that we overextended them because we were just a messy production and had you know bad behaviors. But the third guy, he nailed the audition. We, we did auditions way ahead of time. We made sure that they were able to get off book, all this stuff. Like we, we really, we really were patient, which I think was a good choice with actors to try to find the actors we wanted that we thought we could really jam with. And we found three really great ones. And yeah, this one guy nailed the audition, but then it, when it comes to a couple weeks before the production, I have us do a table read. He's unavailable uh, for work reasons. It's a thing that happens. No big deal. That's why we have table reads. As long as he's off book, once we're doing this, because so much of it's going to be, you know, we're going to do a take and then we're going to improvise. Ultimately, we didn't do that because we were just so far behind the whole time that we just got the takes that we got um, and stayed very on script, which was, again, another thing with the cross coverage. I thought we were doing cross coverage and I thought we would do one take of the lines and then we would start improvising. But when it actually came to doing it, uh, we just shot it as traditionally as we could because we had no other way to do it. So the guy doesn't show up for the rehearsals, whatever. He ends up not being available. We did a Friday, Saturday, Sunday. He ends up not being available for the Sunday. So we had to change the Sunday. We shot Friday, we shot Saturday, and then we shot half of Sunday because the other half was going to be a bunch of stuff that he was in. Because, you know, I have a I have a 25 page script with three characters. All the characters are basically in all the scenes. That's kind of the whole thing. I split up the production. The plan was we were going to do three days and then two days or three days and then a day and a pickup. But we ended up doing three days and then two days. And then there was a huge gap. And then we would do two days and then we had to do another two days and then we had to do a pickup. So we basically every new weekend we had to start over, which is the biggest lesson I feel like I learned is you're better off just doing four days in a work week and maybe finding a way to pay them somehow to sort of compensate for the fact that they're not working. Because otherwise you're starting over every single weekend and you're just, it's not efficient. One thing I thought we did pretty well, but 
by the time we were in production, it ultimately sort of evened itself out was pre-production. I had done a lot of little tiny stuff and I had worked at production companies where they do proper pre-production, but I've also worked in production companies where they do no pre-production and just figure it out. It's sort of the difference between commercial and uh, narrative. And I knew for a fact that I was not a figured out kind of guy. I was a pre-production kind of guy. That's why I had all these planning things. And uh, you know, ultimately everything changed, so it ultimately didn't matter. But I don't regret doing pre-production because at the end of the day, you don't know what you don't know. That's what kept tripping us up is, is I knew we were inexperienced and I knew we didn't really know what we were doing, but you don't know what you don't know and the depth of what we didn't know. I knew I didn't want anybody really, really experienced to show up on our set because I didn't want them to take over the set because I had seen that before many times where an inexperienced director gets overstepped by a DP who just makes the production happen or a gaffer who's more experienced than the DP is basically DPing for the project. I don't want that to happen. I want to make sure that the structure of power that's in place, me and my director, were the ones in charge. But it means nobody was an expert in anything and that, that sort of worked against us a lot of times. But yeah, we did pre-produce the heck out of it, but knowing what I know now, pre-production would have looked completely differently because I would have made sure that, for instance, the camera and the lighting package would have been completely different. But also the locations. I'd say half of all of my pre-production was re-permitting all those locations because every two days I'd have to re-permit locations. I, I think I did permitting for like three or four weeks straight. It was absolutely crazy. The other golden rule with pre-production is have backups on backups on backups. And when you don't have any money and you're paying out of pocket and you're using like three credit cards to sort of hold the load of your debt, uh, there's no backups. At some point we did order like a 40 gigabyte SSD because at some point we knew that Blackmagic camera was gonna max out again and sure enough it did that 40 gigabytes at least got us to lunch, which means we could wipe the card, put another 40 gigabytes in, wipe the card, like at least that got us going. But yeah, I mean, lessons learned. I needed to be a little bit more pragmatic. Three to four shooting days and just getting what we got, not spending all the time building up the student film style of it where you put the cases down, you put the tripod out, you start building lights, you you start working with the actors. Just, just show up, switch on, actors start working. That's what you got. That's what we should have been doing. Didn't know what I didn't know. Uh, the other big thing is control the location. Yes, I was super afraid of lights, but honestly, for what we ended up doing, we could have just used house lights and it wouldn't have made any difference. It would have just looked like the office. We should have just booked uh, an indoor room that we would have been able to dress uh, within an hour and then just knocked it out and not have to worry about other stuff. The sounds would have been on the outside of the walls. There would have been tables for people to sit down at. There would have been bathrooms, all this kind of stuff. And we just didn't do that in favor of the beautiful location, which ultimately didn't matter at all because it was basically just people standing in front of brick walls the whole time. Yes, I, I had this flexible script that I kept changing locations and, and it was pretty interchangeable changing their jobs for the locations. But in hindsight, I probably would have done the opposite. I probably would have committed to either the bar thing or probably the laundromat thing was the better idea and just tried to find something that could have been a laundromat um, somehow and just dress it because at least I would have had control over the situation instead of having to re-permit over and over again. So much time was spent permitting for basically nothing because again, it's film school, so the permitting, I'm faxing it to the person who's literally standing next to me. It was, it was absolutely insane. The whole thing about actors, it's tricky, and I've completely changed my tune about actors because I used to say actors are cattle, just they're crazy and they're weird and just shoot them out and get on with your life. But now I have a completely different perspective, which is actors, they're doing something that nobody else is doing, which is they're putting their emotions on the screen, and that has a different set of stakes and different set of responsibilities. So, for instance, a crew member can have a bad day. A crew member gets the runs, they're having a tough day. It's not necessarily going to affect their work unless they're you know, holding the boom or something. But if an actor has a really off day, it's going to show up on the screen and it's going to show up in the edit and that's going to be a problem. So actors, yes, I think it's great when actors on independent, st on independent stuff help load in, help carry equipment. I think that's totally fine. But when it comes to treating them differently, they do need to be treated differently because they're, they need to be in a headspace. They need to be in an operation where they can actually bring their emotions and do their acting and know their lines and all that kind of stuff. And that means they shouldn't be crew. There should be crew. There should be actors. Crew or crew, actors need kid gloves because they have a different set of responsibilities that the crew makes a mistake, no big deal. The actors make a mistake, it shows up in the edit. Also means pay them. I should have paid my actors. The crew I could have had work for free because we're friends and we all work for free on each other's stuff anyway. I should have paid the actors. It wouldn't have cost that much. Uh, dialogue, the whole Curb Your Enthusiasm thing where they, they improvise, um, we ended up not doing it. I, I regret it because I would have really enjoyed that. But yeah, either, you know, pick a lane. Stick to the script, 
open for improv. They take about the same amount of time if you do them similarly. So, you know, you either shoot it conventionally or you just keep standing back and keep getting coverage and, and just have them figure it out. This, the, the improv stuff, Apatow will tell you, it takes a lot longer to cut together than this stuff, but both can be done in production at about the same time, as long as you do it correctly. We did it wrong in every way possible, and we kind of mixed the two in the worst possible ways. And just less camera stuff altogether. The minutia, I mean, we, we did save a lot of headaches in using our own cameras or using my director's cameras, but it didn't help us because they were different and they were complicated and they were cinema cameras where, honestly, this show lived in the camcorder world. And I, from the beginning, I talked about that. And one of my compromises for getting my director to work on it is she wanted it more cinematic. But ultimately, it didn't matter because the end product wasn't cinematic because we just didn't have time to compose it correctly. And a camcorder would have done the exact same thing. One thing I'm really proud of, and I didn't come up with it on this set. I came up with it years before, I think on a pilot I shot for a buddy at the reality company I was at. But it was basically this idea of a debrief where the department heads, the bosses, uh, for 10 minutes while everybody's shutting things down at the end of the day, sit together and talk about what worked and what didn't work and then how tomorrow's gonna go. So it's sort of like a pre-meeting, a pre-production meeting for tomorrow, but it's, it's also where you get all the tips, where you get the, I used a paper towel as a light, I used tape to do this, that kind of stuff. Well, and actually it was even more useful on my buddy's set who, who he was swing on this and then he was director on another set where my, my director DP'd for him and after the first day they sat down afterwards for like an hour and just went through the whole shot list and basically re-shot re listed the whole thing in like an hour and a half because they had they were right next to each other and they were in the zone and it was fantastic. So debriefs are important and I insist on doing a debrief whenever possible uh, at the end of the day. Food budget. Um, if there's one thing about independent films that I have no tolerance for, it's bad food. If you're not paying people or if you're paying them not what they're worth, the food needs to be absolutely exquisite. The food needs to be what they're talking about. Because otherwise, if, if the food is just Subway and Domino's, you have crappy food and you're doing sort of a vanity project for somebody who you're probably never going to see it again. Like there's nothing there's nothing useful there to anybody except for the person who's the vanity person. And so at least food, your time isn't completely worthless. And I've just I've figured out that good food at any budget level is important. I mean, when you have money, good food is good food. But when you don't have money, good food also sort of takes a sting out of the fact that you're losing money by being there. But again, money is also nice. If they're worth something, pay them. Ultimately, the cost of production is gonna be so much more than the cost of paying an individual for their time. And the reward of having the individual there on pay, at least earning something, is better than them just being there eating hot dogs. Some other stuff I do differently. Um, 25 pages, four shoot days, get in, get out, quick, quick, camcorders, the whole thing, just Easy, bing, bang, boom, everything fits in a Mini Cooper, that whole thing. Probably have the shoot day, you know, Monday through Wednesday or Tuesday through Friday, something like that, during the, during the week consecutive so that the first day is always gonna be a disaster, but then you have, you know, muscle memory for the rest of the days, where instead of what I did was pairs and triples of starting over, starting over, starting over. Yeah, interiors, don't be afraid of lights. You just need to know at the lowest of budgets, you're either going to light it or you're not going to light it. And it really depends on what the script calls for. If the script calls for a cinematic thing, maybe you need to spend more time and more energy on the camera and lighting. And if it doesn't, don't bother. It's not worth it. Also, inserts, pickups, any of the stuff that you don't actually need the actors for, don't even put that in the schedule initially. I mean, for film school, they made us account for everything because it was important because of reasons, which I understand, but it didn't. we did not need to be shooting pickups of people literally picking a coffee mug up uh, while the actors were there. That was just wasting actors' time. We can just fake actor hands if we run out of time. That's not a problem. Also set BTS, and I, we didn't do much BTS on our set because there were so few of us. Um, we did a little bit of phone stuff. I passed a camera around, but we didn't really have it. But I found for, especially for student films, uh, Having somebody do BTS, whether or not that's their only job, usually I would do audio and BTS or I would do grip and BTS, but I would, I would do a little bit of video, do a little bit of photos because if it's going to film festivals, they're going to ask for additional material other than just the footage you took. And so, you know, there's some golden rules. No, never film anybody eating, no bathroom stuff, and no tense, emotional, you know, somebody's having beef with somebody on set. None of that stuff makes the BTS, but the rest of the stuff you need to prove that everybody was alive in there. Also, it super helps for the edit, for the editor to be able to see the camera setup. And the other big thing is work within your means. Um, I was paying out of pocket and so our means were very tiny, but we were also way too ambitious. I think sort of the sweet spot for films is you want your film to be 85% of what you're capable of doing. That way you have sort of a 15% buffer in case you need to use it of money, resources, time, whatever it is 
to sort of improve upon the product. Now, the problem with film school and the problem with uh, student films in general is nobody has a really good gauge of what they're capable of yet, so they way overestimate. So there's too many stunts, too many special effects, too many visual effects, all this stuff that makes it too hard. I think my script, especially just the dialogue and the material itself, was probably 200% instead of 85%. So it was twice as big as it should have been. It should have been less than 100%. It was too ambitious, and that seems to be the tone for most experimental stuff anyway, but I should have known better. Also, fix it in post, if you've heard the cliche, is a terrible, terrible, terrible idea. But there's certain situations in post that you can get away with. If you're not gonna be able to get good dialogue, it just expect to do ADR, that's fine. That's a different schedule, that's not so time dependent. Although honestly, labs and pockets, even just this mic into an iPhone, into a pocket on voice record, is absolutely fine and then you don't have to do ADR. But like anything that requires sort of really post-specialist stuff, um, have the editing person, or have the ha if you're the one editing, know how to do that ahead of time, because otherwise you're not gonna know what to look for, because you're still gonna need certain stuff on set that you might not get uh, if you don't know what to look for. Also, post-production is post-production, and I'm not really gonna talk about post, but we did do post. Regrets. Well, I don't know, because the whole thing about in film school, even if it's your thesis, is it's learning, it's a safe environment, it's a controlled environment for you to make mistakes uh, and, and learn from your mistakes. And I will say, this was by far the most ambitious project I had been on up until that date that I was uh, you know, in charge of. And so I learned a huge amount, but it was also a huge amount of what not to do, just based on mistakes, trial and error, all that kind of stuff. So I don't regret any of that, but it wasn't great. One thing I do regret is just when you're on set and you're busy, especially if you're under-resourced or understaffed, that's when you make mistakes and you treat people badly, and there's no reason to treat people badly. If there's anything to take away from this, it's morale is key and treating people well is important. I'd rather have a total disaster of a film and know that I did right by everybody than try to squeak out the best possible film and know that I wronged people as I went. At least anecdotally, a lot of small films and especially a lot of student films, the treating people element of it is the part that gets overlooked and people get really mistreated or wronged or manipulated and it's just not great. Uh, and it's not just about treating the actors well, it's about treating your crew well too. I don't know, that's it, I lost my voice. Um... It's taken me it's taken me days to days to do this just because I'm I'm getting the 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 sweats of remembering what it was like but yeah that that was it